continuation of what we've been talking about the past couple weeks, um, which is spiritual warfare. We've been talking about the, the mighty warrior of God. We've been talking about the army of God, which is the church. And um, we've also been talking about... <laughs> good morning on TV. Um, we've been talking about, um, uh, last week, the actual armament that we have, according to Ephesians 6. And is that, is that on? Okay. Just want to make sure I don't have to get up and... All right. So this morning, let's talk about... Let's go a little bit more. We're going to talk for the next two weeks on uh, the furtherance of that. We're going we're gonna to begin to talk about our weapons of attack. Okay, we have an offensive weapon, which is our sword, the sword of the spirit, but what are weapons that we use to attack the enemy? Um, so we're going to go after that. Um, Ephesians 6, 12, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. To reiterate again, we're not in a physical fight like we're going to go out today and run someone over or something like that. We're in a fight against the enemy. We're in a fight against an enemy that actually is invisible, but his power can and is manifested in the spiritual and the physical. In the same respect, the power we have through the name of Jesus Christ is also manifested in the physical and the spiritual. The thing is, we have more authority than the enemy does. That victory, that authority has already been paid for and bought with a price. So, as a result, we need not to fear what the enemy can do because we have authority. Can you see what that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, last week the thing that we didn't we didn't cover um, regarding the the uh, our armaments is the fact that there is a blind side. As Christians, we do have a blind side. Now, I believe that, that God did that on purpose. And there are many people who will give you different versions um, talking about the fact, you know, I, I do know, for example, on the breastplate, the breastplate goes over your head, so it does cover your back a bit. But the reality is our backside is the blind side. When you're fighting in battle, if I were fist fighting someone and I decided to turn on and punch the wall instead and face my back to them, would I be protected? No. Even if I had, you know, like a punching bag on my back, I wouldn't know where he's going to punch. I wouldn't know where the thing is going to come from. I wouldn't know where the attack is coming. I wouldn't know how things are going. And as a result, the attack that would come against me would be kind of a surprise and would probably leave me more delu disillusioned than a frontal assault. Because at least with a frontal assault, you know where you're going to get hit. And as a result, our backside needs to become protected. Now, we know that God is our rear guard, as it states in Scripture. But we know that in this war, we are not meant to retreat. I believe in my heart that a big uh, aspect of not having weapons and protection on our back is because the Lord never intended for his church to be running in fear of the devil. I'm not saying it was an afterthought like, oops, I didn't give him something to put on. Oh, no. No, I think he intentionally said, listen, your weapons are strong and they're mighty and they're impenetrable when you're moving forward. What good is the sword of the Lord when you're running in fear? Who do you end up really hurting with your sword? Yourself, but the others around you. Because you're still flailing like a little baby and oh no, no. And the word of God, the Bible says, is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So when you're still flailing it around and you're running in fear, chances are you might hit someone on your own team. <coughs> and so the enemy uses that. When we literally have fear, and anyone ever noticed when anyone dealt with fear in their life? When you tend to run in fear, you take it out on those around you. And that's what ends up happening. And I've walked through that myself. So as a result, I mean, I walked through panic attacks in a mall. And Sandy's with me, and I'm literally grabbing her, and I'm like, we're leaving now. But my attitude isn't, okay, we need to go. My attitude is, get your bags, we're leaving now. And I'm, I, because there's this, this imminent fear of, I need to get out, I need to go, let's get out. And it doesn't just affect me, it affects my wife, it affects my kids. So as a result, when we, don't, we, don't, when we run in fear, we're retreating, we're living in a, in a sense of fear, we leave ourselves open 
to things that we ought not to be facing. And a lot of times in our lives, we're going to end up with arrows in our back and we'll be like, but how did that happen? And I'll tell you, nine times out of ten, it's because you ran in fear and you were not meant to get hit that way. If your shield was up and you were at least moving forward, you would have not gotten affected the way you did. And so I believe that even though the breastplate of righteousness goes around the back and it will protect you to a point, the rest of you is still unprotected. And it's important that we understand that. We, when we retreat, we give the devil the opportunity to wound us. And we are not to give up in this fight. Don't ever turn around and say, I just give up. I just can't do this anymore. I'm done. And I'm sure if I asked for a raising of hands, I'm sure the majority of people would probably say, yep, nah, been there, done that. And when you do that, and especially when you profess it with your mouth, the enemy's ears perk up, and he's like, oh, there's one over there. And he doesn't just send one to go get you. He sends a legion to say, hey, go harass him, go take him down. Because he knows that when that happens, you're walking away from the battle. And you're unprotected. And you have no idea what's going on. And when it hits you, and you think about it, when you're down in the dumps and something just piles on, it's like a hundred times worse. Everything's just magnified. Everything that's bad is just worse. So we need to make it a point as Christians, let's never retreat from the battle. Let's never turn our backs on the enemy. As a matter of fact, let's link our shields with one another. Okay? And let's go into that point here, linking our shields with one another. We need to learn to trust as Christians. I tend to say that's probably an area that Christians have as the weakest point. And you'd think that because of the love of God, we would learn to trust one another. However, how many times have we been jaded by other Christians? Have, have the Christian behind us in line had the spear out and, oops, I poked you, I'm sorry. And you get that little thing, or there's a full-fledged wound in your back, right? How many times have you had someone gossip or say something about you, and as a result, you're like, I don't trust people anymore. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to stay in the line with them. We as Christians need to learn how to trust one another. And we need to learn how to become trustworthy with one another. Because if we're truly in the battle against the enemy, as the church of Christ, and we're, we're called to march in line, shoulder to shoulder with someone next to us, we better be able to depend on them. Do we really trust one another in this army that we call the church? Do we really trust people? I'm not saying that to stir up doubt in your mind. I'm saying, but do we really trust people? You see, the Romans back in the day, they used a fighting formation called the phalanx. And this phalanx was a closed rank military maneuver. Okay? This was shoulder to shoulder lines. There was, it was, there was no way to get in. Okay? Shields along the side and along the front. Okay? So when you're marching and you've got shields along the side, you don't need to worry about behind. There ain't nothing behind you. But you've got this formation of thousands of soldiers, shields interlinked, literally, because they had linking mechanisms that they would link their shields. And they're moving forward. So on the side is protected, and on the front is protected, and they had stuff to protect their heads. Where's the weak point? There was nothing that these soldiers, you would literally have to send men who would be willing to die to try and bust through the line to get through. They knew where each other was and what they were doing. Speaking of accountability in this war, are we truly accountable to one another? Or if someone in love comes to you and says, hey brother, hey sister, are you just like, you know, you can't tell me. There are certain circumstances that I think someone in leadership should, have, should be the one saying things, but generally speaking, are we going to one another? Are we accountable to one another? Because I'm telling you, that soldier in the Roman phalanx, he wasn't looking at the guy to the left or right and going, I wonder if they're going to protect me today. He didn't have time. He didn't have time to worry about what the person left or right or front and back was doing. All he knew was, they better have my back. And, it, and the other thing that it speaks of is that when that soldier couldn't handle what was in front of them, they had many people around them to aid them. When they were in a fight, you didn't just fight one Roman soldier. You had multiple soldiers at one time. This was a unified effort. 
And as a result, there was much strength in what they did. That's why they're credited to almost conquering the known world at that time. They were the strongest civilization up until, I believe, the United States and England and the modern times. They were the strongest civilization that had ever walked. Their army was revered. We need to learn to trust one another like this, to have each other's backs, and to not go at this as a lone soldier. Remember, we're part of an army, the army of God. And when we whip out the sword and we're like, I'm just going to go get the devil! But we're not in line and we're not in formation. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. We were never meant to fight this battle alone. And far too often as Christians, we say, well, if no one's going to fight with me, though no, none go with me, I'm going anyways. Unless the Lord has specifically told you to go do something on your own, you had better make sure that it's God. Because you have authority in the name of Jesus. But the enemy, we got to realize, does have strength and does have power. And when we belittle him, we fill up with pride. And when we go to attack the enemy, we wind up hurt. So we need to be trustworthy and surround ourselves with warriors that will not rank rank in us. We need to surround ourselves with people that we know are not going anywhere. And we need to learn to do that. And as so, we link arms. And you know what? We don't allow little things to get in the way. Petty things, we work through them, smile, hug, love, and move forward. We don't allow the little things, the little rats, the little foxes to spoil the vine here. We push those things aside and say, you know what? I know sister and so-and-so's heart. I know brother so-and-so's heart. And you know what? I'm not going to allow this to happen. This is not worth it. And as a result, I think that's a big thing with the church as far as our denominational differences. We have allowed those to infiltrate the army of God, which is his church. And as a result, we've become fractioned. And instead of being unified, we've got sections of army that are, instead of being together, they're off on their own separate part of the battlefield. And they're getting hit left and right because there's open ranks and open positions in our army. And it was never meant to happen that way. So, we're talking about learning to trust. So when we go learning to trust, where do we go from there? If we're going to learn to trust, and we, we do trust people, and we have this Christian, this Church of God phalanx, if you want to call it that, where we truly are learning how to walk side by side, shoulder to shoulder, step by step, in line going forward. Notice I've never said here that we stop to rest and that we're stopping to kind of put a defensive position up. We're moving forward in this. We're not stopping, we're moving forward. So the next step is we've got to learn to take it to the devil. We've got to learn to go after him. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. So, the sword we wield can only reach as far as our arms will swing. Correct? The sword we have, I mean, unless you fling it, and you don't have a sword anymore, unless you fling it, it's only as far as your arms are going to reach. So we need to learn as Christians, we need to learn some uh, weapons of attack. And I'm going to get into a couple things this week, but I'm going to finish. I'm actually going to get four main ones next week. I guess you'll just have to be here next week, won't you? Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Um, so let me be clear, though. When I say that we need to go after the devil, we need to make sure that there's a strategy in the battle. Does, that, does everyone understand what I'm talking about? When we go at it haphazardly, we end up confused and thoroughly defeated. Now, I'm going to say this this morning, and I don't say this because I think he was wrong, but he didn't go with protection. I walked through this myself. I had my father go up against witches and warlocks. And I had him debate them, and he, I didn't have to, I mean, he debated them, and he went up against them, and he literally had phone calls threatening his life. The thing was, he had, did not have that prayer covering. He didn't have enough protection around him, and, and when there was a direct threat by a person in the church who claimed to be a prophetess, using their gift in a demonic way, he took it lightly. He didn't take it as seriously as he should have. And as a result, I'm not saying that 
oh, this was the devil. But I mean, there was a direct link to his death a year later. And I'm telling you that we need to understand that when we go at things and we're just like, I'm just going to do it because it's what we're going to do. We need to make sure that there's a battle strategy, that there's protection around us, maybe intercessors, that there are enough things going on that we know that we're protected and we're safe. The Bible does say that we're to go after the enemy. But it doesn't say do it in a foolish way. I mean, can you imagine if our troops went over, over to Afghanistan without any armament or protection? And they were just running through the valleys, just shooting at everything. And they'd be like, yeah, you know, like the G.I. Joe's, you know, those crazy people that just start shooting the gun everywhere. Right? What would happen to them two seconds later? They'd be dead. They'd be dead. Because there's no protection. Do they have strength and force? Yes. Do they have bullets and, and munitions and whatever they need? Yes, they have everything they need. But if they go into it haphazardly, like, let's just go and do this, we're going to conquer the world. Next thing you know, they're all laying dead on the, on the valley floor. Because there's no strategy. There's no protection. There's no maneuvering. Now, I know that me sound like, well, how are we supposed to do that? Well, we as Christians need to learn to develop battle plans. And I've heard people say all the time, like, I'm just going to go to this, you know, for example, we have a spiritualist temple here in East Aurora, which teaches tarot card reading and, and teaches people how to become witches and warlocks and things of that nature. Okay, and it's about three or four miles from here. Okay, right in the village. So, does that mean that after church today that, you know, maybe one of us or a couple of us should just jump in our car and go there and just lay hands on the door and start praying over it? No, 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 no. If, if God told you specifically today to do that, you better let someone know what you're doing. Make sure that there's prayer cover. Kind of like the, uh, when someone's going in, they have air cover, and they drop the bombs on the, on the inner aircraft stuff, and they clear the field so that the army can go in. And make sure there's prayer, prayer covering over our atmosphere. But you need to make sure that you're careful when you go in. Because you go at something like that, you don't understand what defenses the enemy has put up there. And as a result, if you're not aware, and you don't have a battle strategy, and you're not in prayer ready to do it, I don't even want to... You, you just, you better be careful. Because what the enemy comes at us with, I said he comes at us in a spiritual manner. But there's a lot of manifestations in the physical. And I've heard of and seen of a lot of people die in the physical realm as a result of foolish Christian behavior. This battle is real. Make no mistake about it. So the weapons of attack here. The weapons of attack are meant to assail, attack, or take down strongholds of the enemy. Do you realize that we have authority to take down strongholds? Through the blood of Jesus. We have the authority to take down strongholds. Demonic strongholds, strongholds of poverty and of sickness. Every stronghold we have authority over. In the name of Jesus. In the war that we're in, the army who advances is the one who wins. Sitting on defense doesn't work. As long as Satan keeps the church on the defensive, the kingdom of hell can't be taken down. If we as Christians are hunkered in a, in a bunker, that rhymes, we're hunkered down in a bunker, and we're, we're just waiting for the attack, okay? And we've got our shields up, and we're just ready. We're like, okay, devil, we're ready for it. Are we truly ever going to be able to defeat his kingdom? Because we're not going after him. So we need to make sure that we understand that we have authority to go on the offensive. Matthew 16, 18 says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. This is Jesus talking to Peter, but there's a meaning in this verse. The un this is what it means. The unseen kingdom of Satan will not be too strong for the church. The church has authority over that. In this passage, Jesus didn't mean that Satan was going to batter the church. And then just when all hope seems lost, here comes Jesus. Doo-doo, the trumpet, we're all raptured. No, yay, okay, we put up with the battering long enough. No, that's not what this passage means at all. As a matter of fact, what it means is that, <clears throat> excuse me, he was referring to an offensive church that the gates of hell would not be able to withstand. He's basically saying, Peter, you're going to establish a church here. Not just Peter, but you disciples here, you're going to establish a church that the gates of hell cannot even stand up against. When you go after them, they're going to crumble. That's what he's telling us. That we have that kind of authority. So, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Number one, the church has two main priorities in this. First, it's to build. Second, it's to battle. And I've heard my mom say a lot of times, I mean, she's quoted from Jeremiah, talking about how you have a sword in one hand and you're ready to build in another. And that's pretty much what we're going to talk about here. If we're going to truly establish the kingdom of God, we've got to have our sword in one hand, and we've got to be ready to build the kingdom of God in the other. Which means we're fighting the enemy, but at the same time we're rescuing lives. And we're building the kingdom one life at a time. So we're ready on both fronts. It's a dual-fronted assault. The reality is, if we're just going at it like, we're going to attack and we're going to battle, then when people come into the kingdom, we're not ready to handle it. We have no idea what to do. But if all we're doing is going after people, but not understanding we need to fight the strongholds that hold them, we'll never get them. And we'll come to our church for maybe a couple weeks, and then that stronghold will latch hold of it even stronger and pull them away, and we're going to be frustrated. Like, oh my gosh, what happened? Why are these people falling back into sin and doing all this stuff? We need to understand we have to go at this with both fronts. Not just one, and not just the other. We're always building the church while battling Satan. In this passage, I'm sorry, <clears throat> it's not the church keeping Satan out. You understand? We, we're, Satan is, you know, and I, I've, had, I've talked with people that, you know, there have been churches I've been in, and there are witches that attend, and there are warlocks that come, and there are actually even demons present. And people are like, oh my gosh, that's not possible. It is. It is possible. And I'll tell you something. Who cares? Who cares? Do we need to worry about ourselves and worship about a witch sitting in our church? They're going to be there. It is what it is. They have no authority. They have no authority in our worship. And if they start to try and manifest or speak out, pick them up and remove them. Say, out. Oh. They have no authority. In the name of Jesus Christ. But the reality is, it's Satan failing to keep the church up. We've had this stance as a church for far too long. That, oh, we need to not let Satan into our churches. So what have we done? We've established four walls and said, sit in here if you want to be a Christian. Am I right? We will not let Satan in this church because he will influence and infiltrate and he'll ruin everything. Here's the dirty little secret. He's in there anyway. He's in the church anyways. You want to know why? Because there are people who come to know Christ who still have baggage. They come into the church and they bring their baggage with them. So now, without realizing that these people are bringing the spirit with them that they're at, and the church is being influenced by that. Therefore, and here's a good example. How many times have you seen the church progressing and doing awesome and then one person who's had a massive problem with lust walk into the church? And all of a sudden... Things just keep falling apart. And you're wondering, oh my gosh, what's happening? But instead of actually attacking that, what do we do? We look at those people and say, oh, you got a problem, get out. you got a problem, get out. You can't belong here, get out. So we then tried to, we tried to expel Satan in the way we're admitting we don't have power over you. What? Well, instead of taking those people and saying, are you willing to become under accountability, we're going to pray and we're going to take authority over the Spirit. And we're not going to allow the spirit here, but we're going to let you come here. Because you're going to find freedom. You're going to find deliverance. You're going to find wholeness. And with you, you're going to be another piece of the wall. Your strength of what you've come out of, you're going to be placed right on the wall. And each of us is going to form more of a wall and more of a wall and more of a wall. And we're going to become strong through that. But instead, as a church, we've backed off and said, you know what? Just can't have it. They're too filthy. So the world out there then looks, they look into the church and says, I don't want anything to do with those filthy heathens, those, those completely hypocritical people. They preach one thing, but they really don't want me. I smoke. They don't want me in church. I do drugs. They don't want me in church. Who did Jesus come to save? The lost. If, if this is not a place of healing and wholeness, then what else, what else is? This is the place that people need to come to. This is the place we should want people to come to. Demons and all. We take the whole person. Not leave your junk at the door. You can come in because we have authority. Once you're in here, those demons are in authority. And so as a result, we need to understand that we need to take a different approach. Instead of, we're not going to let Satan in. Fine, you can come in here. But we're going to go out. And guess what happens then? His strategy has to change. 
Because then he worries less about being in the church and sending people into the church because we're no longer there. Now he's got to try and put up defenses on the outside. But once we're on the offensive, there's some pretty awesome things here. Okay? So, the Bible talks about storming the gates. Correct? Storming the gates of hell. The Bible says here that... Um, the gates of hell will not be able to overpower it. Well, this a lot of this sermon, like I said, even next week's too, is coming out of that book, Spiritual Warfare, by Derek Prince. The guy's just, the guy's just amazing. I mean, the, the truth that, like I said, I would encourage you to get this book. And I got it from that Christian library, so when I return it, if you want it, just ask him for it. I mean, it is, it's incredible. It will open your eyes to some absolute, you'll read it and be like, I read that verse, but, oh, that's what it meant. It, it, it seriously is one of those aha moments throughout the entire book. Okay, it's not just one page, it's like every page you're like, oh, I didn't think, oh, oh, and before you know it, you're like, you're done with the book, your head's a little spinny after one chapter because you're, you're devouring it, but then it makes sense, and you're like, okay. So last week, I'll tell you something real quick. Last week, we talked about the actual armor, correct? And so I'm driving to work, and I got the enemy coming at me in my mind, and he loved to come at me with, I'm going to kill your wife, I'm going to kill your kids. He loves to tell me that every day. Every single day, he loves to tell me that. And he puts pictures, because I'm a very picture guy. I love being out in nature. I'm very visual. So he puts these, when I'm driving, these flashes of pictures in my brain. Things like a car accident. Things, these crazy things. So you know what I did this week? Just to put it in practice? Because I put on the armor. And then I said, you know what, Lord? I said, in the name of Jesus, I put on the helmet of salvation. Protect my mind. Gone. The thoughts were gone. The helmet protected everything. And I found that during the day when I was driving and I had a bad attitude with someone, someone cut me off. I'm like, you little nerd. I could, you almost could feel, the, you could feel the helmet come off because the flesh took over. And then I would feel thoughts come back. So what did, I, what did I do? I didn't put the rest of the armor back on. It was still on. It was the piece that was missing. And so I thought, what is it that's missing right now? It's my helmet. Lord, I put the helmet of salvation back on. Boom. Protected instantly again. And it became one of those things throughout the week that it really helped me. And I would encourage you to do the same thing because it really is a very simple thing. You find yourself doing it, and when you find a situation in your life, maybe there's no peace in your life, and there's such turmoil, you put those shoes back on, the preparation of the gospel of peace, and then you become ready to bring peace wherever you're at. And you, you, you find you need to take a step back first and look and say, okay, what's going on? And then you need to determine, okay, no longer am I going to let these arrows come at me. I'm going after them. Because I've carried this, this philosophy in life. If the devil's going to come after you anyways, why not go after him? Right? Why stand there and take arrow upon arrow upon arrow, either in your breastplate or in your shield or whatever? Why stand there and let him come after you? It doesn't make any sense. Would you let someone with a gun just continue to shoot at you? No. You either, if someone was pointing a gun, you'd be shooting back at them and you'd be running. And then if they took off, if someone was shooting a gun at you and they missed, and then they started running away, would you run in fear? I don't know about you. I'd find the nearest stick, boulder, iron, you know, something, metal something, a tire iron, something. And I'd be, I'd be going all psycho on that person, okay? Because you, at that, right, at that point I heard that word, but I'm not going to use that word in the sermon here, but you get pretty PO'd. You get ticked off. Oh, okay. You get pretty ticked off. Right? But in the spirit... There's some, you find Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus got righteously angry, okay? And it's okay for us, to, when the enemy comes at us, and he's, he's attacking our family. He's attacking our friends. I know so many people who died of cancer. Isn't enough enough? Shouldn't we get to the point where we're like, you know what, I am so sick and tired of your garbage. I'm not going to put up with your garbage. We get ticked off in the spirit, and as a church, we decide enough's enough. We're going to knock you out. Why shouldn't we be doing that? So we need to get a little righteously angry. Draw our swords, get in line, and stop being on the defensive. You may have a few arrows in your shield, and if you've watched 300, you take the shield, take your sword, and you cut those arrows right off, and you march forward. You go after the enemy. Because here's what Gate talks about here. The gates of hell will not be able to stand up against it. Gate means... In the old times, this is what is being written about. This is Paul writing, so this is where he's coming from in those days. The gate was a place of counsel and rule. 
In those days, it's where the ruling council elders rule from. So Satan's councils it's talking about here will be ineffective and destroyed. His leadership, his, quote, authority, whatever you want to call it, his organization, because that's where the organization came from, the elders, the leaders, the town brain trust met there. So it's saying that the brain trust of Satan, the stuff that Satan uses, will be ineffective against the church. What is it speaking of to you? Is that not speaking of Jesus saying, hey, I died on the cross, I went down to hell and I beat it out of Satan, took the keys back, now I took all authority. I took every authority. He Basically, he's impotent. Satan has no weapons that really can be effective unless we let him. So we as a church need to learn to start going after him, after those gates. Because here's an interesting part, if you really think about it. The gate was the weakest part of the wall of the city. The weakest part. Every other part was held together by brick and mortar. This part was just held, it was either a wooden gate or you have those iron gates, but they were, into, they were put into the wall. But you took a battering ram, you could rip it right out of the wall. So as a result, Satan's gates that are ineffective are also the same gates that are the weakest point that we need as Christians to attack. His places that he thinks he has authority, lust, poverty, um, sickness, infirmity, fear, torment, those things, those gates, as a church, we need to start coming into authority. So here's what we need to do as Christians and when we come together. And we did this the other night in our prayer time. We need to come together as Christians. We're two or more gathered. He's there in the midst. And we need to start praying against those things. And we need to take the authority in the name of Jesus and say, Satan, you have no authority. I command the spirit of fear to leave. I command it not only to leave here, but the city of Buffalo and this region gone in the name of Jesus. And we need to continue to pray these things. And when these prayers are going, we're battering the gates. And there's going to come a point soon, I'm telling you, there's coming a point soon because of prayers that have been offered for years and years and years over this region, over this city. The gates are being battered. The battering ram of the Holy Spirit is just boom, boom, boom. And very, very, very shortly, those gates are going to come crumbling down. And it doesn't matter how strong the walls are. Because we're going to flood into his city, and we're going to take it back. And we will not take prisoners. We will not say, okay, well, you can stay. You can. No, 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 no. We will annihilate the enemy. Not one thing will be allowed to stay because we will have complete authority. So, let's not be waiting for where Satan will strike next. Let's make Satan worried where we're going to hit him. Different mindset. Colossians 2, 15 says, When he, Jesus, had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. He disarmed Satan and all of hell when he went down and beat the snot out of them and then raised from the dead. Their weapons are nerf darts compared to what we have. He is disarmed. Yet we give him so much place and we cower in fear. We need not do it anymore. We need not do that anymore. 2 Corinthians 2.14 But thanks be to God who always, not sometimes, always leads us in triumph. He's the general. He's leading us in triumph. In Christ. Everything is done through the blood of Jesus and nothing else. And manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. So as a result of God leading us into battle and into triumph over everything we go, every time we triumph, a sweet aroma of Christ is left. In every place. There is no room for the enemy anymore. We conquer it, he's driven out. The world will only see Christ's victory when his church demonstrates it. Why? Is God too weak? No. He's chosen the church to be his vehicle of bringing his authority and his kingdom on earth. He, the Bible says, when he left and went up to heaven, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go and preach and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things I've commanded you. And I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus, in that statement, is saying, I have been given all authority in the universe. Now, I give it to you. Go storm the gates of hell, beat Satan down, and take back this physical world from my kingdom. 
So we're fighting a spiritual battle to take back physical ground. This region of Buffalo that has been so tormented and depressed for over 100 years, the church has kind of just let it sit there and let it sit there. And we've been fractured, and we've had some churches saying, we're praying, we're praying, we're going to believe, we're going to believe. When the unity in the church comes, the true authority of the church will be recognized in this region. And something unbelievable will be birthed. And I'm teaching this, and I believe God wants me to do this right now, because I believe we as I-61 need to get ready. We need to get ready because the war is already on. Every Christian is in it, as I talked about a couple weeks ago. Every Christian is in it. So whether you want to be in it or not, it doesn't matter. You're in the war. Even if you're not a Christian, you're in the war. You're either working for God or you're working against God. Period. And the reality is we as Christians need to understand what the fight is all about. And we need to understand that things that happen in our lives, first of all, are for a reason. But we need to understand what's really going on behind it. So we can pray against it. Last night, I gotta tell you, I, I was trying to stream the Sabres game. Okay? I blew it. It was my fault. And I went on to a website. We hooked it up to our TV. And we were going. And then all of a sudden, a malware attacked. And shut down her computer. Now this is her work computer. And this is the computer we use for all of our church files. Gone. Right in the middle of us trying, getting ready to prepare for this morning. Now, we could have easily just been like, oh, darn it, and bleep this, and I can't believe it. We could have, you know, you carry, you know, you get in the flesh, you get the attitudes, and you start getting all frustrated, and we could have done that. But we had a couple friends over last night. And while this was going on, the computer was over at the table, and one of the friends said, I think it would be a little weird if we laid hands on the computer and just prayed that God's protection would be over it. And I'm like, no, not at all. So she said, okay, let me pray. And she just started praying and prayed over the computer. I know some people who probably are listening on that, this online are going to be like, oh my gosh, you're crazy. No, you're not. no, I'm not. If we're fighting an enemy that is in every aspect of our lives, then we need to learn to pray over every aspect of our lives. Not over pray, but just pray over. You understand? You don't need to pray 50 times for the same thing. You take authority once and it's done. You know, you bring something into your home. You go out to someone's home and, and you bring in like a new chair. You better pray over that before you bring it in your home. You have no idea what they're dabbling in and what may be trying. And I know some people are like, oh my gosh, it's physical things. Listen, I've walked too many things in my life and I've walked through too many things to put anything past the devil. If there is a chink in your armor, he's not going to come through the wall if it's strong. He's going to come through the gate of your door that you're going to bring something in, the Trojan horse. And when you're least expecting it, he's going to wreak havoc. And last night when we did that, we prayed over it. And then we had to do due diligence and we brought it to see and it's fixed. Now there's a few things that are still yet to be worked out, but it's fixed. We're able to use it this morning. What I'm saying is the enemy will try and use everything and anything he can, but what you do with it is what matters. You're going to have situations every day. Do you learn to take authority in them? Do you learn to walk over them? Or are you living under them? Oh, woe is me. Oh, my computer crashed. Oh, no. What's going to happen now? Is, but seriously, is, is, that how, is that how we walk every day? So many Christians do. We need to learn to have a different mindset and a different mentality where we walk above that and we say, listen, I know I'm, I'm down about this, but I declare in the name of Jesus a different situation. And we need to walk in that. And we need to recognize in every situation what the enemy really is doing and come at that aspect. You know, when I say we come at that spirit, so many people are like, oh my gosh, you're talking about spirits. Okay, so you watch a scary movie, and then it's thundering outside, and you're alone at home, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's a spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. So don't get all crazy on me, like, oh my gosh, spirit. Okay, then call it fear. You're afraid. So what? It's the same thing. It's a spirit. And we need to realize that instead of, oh my gosh, you need to learn to take authority over that spirit and say, in the name of Jesus, I declare fear out of my home. Right? Is that not what it is? You're afraid? It's fear. So then you take fear and you cast it out. We need to learn to recognize as Christians, be smart in the battle. What, is it what are the arrows coming at us? What are the arrows? Have the eagle eye. What are the arrows? Okay, it's fear coming at us. Okay, it's poverty coming at us. It's this or that. Okay, I declare, and boom, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, these arrows are cleared. Clear path to victory. And so, next week we're going to talk about the strategy, the ways that we actually get these victories. And I want to encourage you to be back.
If you're not, that's okay. There's no judgment. But I would encourage you to be back. But I, I really feel strongly like we're, we're at a precipice. And what happened here on Friday night in our prayer and our praise time was, was pretty intense. <coughs> and um, I just believe we're at a real critical point. Not just as I sick you up, but I mean the region. We're at a critical point. And I find it interesting because um, Buffalo just got granted a billion dollars. And now, there's all, there, everyone's encouraging people to send it to the mayor and the county executive and say, what should we do with the money? Well, let's pray that God's will is done upon it. Let's pray that this region is lifted up from the money and not just goes into greedy coffers and people who backdoor the deals and do all the, the greedy things. Let's pray that God's will is done in this city and that it revitalizes this region to where it was called to be. Um, Buffalo, New York is the only place in this country that has the kind of natural power that we have. It's called Niagara Falls. They've built dams and they've built power structures and stuff, but there's nothing naturally in this country like Niagara Falls. We live in a region of authority and of power, and we need to come back to that in the kingdom of God. And so I'm going to close in prayer today. I'm just going to ask that as we're closing in prayer, just something simple. I like to do this every week because I feel like it helps you be introspective and kind of put the sermon together, even if you're going to forget it ten minutes after you leave. But at least at this moment, you're praying it. And I'm going to ask that you pray that if there's, if maybe you're afraid or you've been one of those Christians that kind of been on the defense of a lot, and you've not learned how to start moving forward and taking steps towards the battle, or even towards the enemy to say, I'm not going to let you do this anymore. All of us have gone through hell in our families, in one way or another. That's the biggest area he's attacked, his families. We need to learn that we have authority. We can kick him away from our families and put a hedge of protection around them. <coughs> around our families, our loved ones. And so as I close in prayer, I'm just going to ask you to just simply just pray to God. Lord, I commit to you today that I will be on the offensive as a Christian. I'm not going to cower in fear anymore. That's all I want you to do. And as we all do that today, we're linking shields and we're getting ready for battle. Lord, I thank you this morning for your word. Lord, I, I pray that I adequately uh, was able to break that apart and, and disseminate it to your people. And I just pray, Lord God, that this word would not return void, but Lord, it would go and penetrate each heart, including mine. Lord, let us live as Christians and learn to live as Christians on the offensive, not on the defensive. So that we would never retreat, that we would never stop and cease to go after and establish the kingdom of God on this earth. I pray, Lord God, that you would help each of us today to recognize the authority you've placed in us. And I pray that we would learn to walk in it. Not going up to people's faces, being belligerent or ridiculous about it, but literally, Lord God, that in our prayer, that we would literally take authority over things in our lives, and even over things in other people's lives, to see them free. See them whole, Lord God. That we would carry a sword in one hand and a brick and mortar in the other. Lord, that we're building your kingdom and we're at war at the same time. I pray that you touch each and every person in this place here, Lord God. Build us spiritual muscles, Lord God. Lord, that we are confident in you and confident in our ability to battle. Lord, let us those of us in this room that are not ready, Lord, let us not j try and jump to the front line and get ready for battle when we're not ready. Let us take the time to get ready. Then when it's our time, then we'll be called up. But I pray, Lord God, that you would do a work in each and every heart this morning, Lord God. And this morning, Satan, I bind and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I command you to take your lies, your torment, and your behaviors, and I command you to leave each and every person and from tormenting and around each and every person in this room in the name of Jesus. That there may not be a possession in them, but Lord, each and every person has things that are being harassed of them every day. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, a protection and a covering will be around about every person. Lord God, that as they walk, they will walk in victory and authority and never in woundedness and fear. And I declare freedom over your people this morning in the name of Jesus. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and grant you his peace. And you're going out greater when you came in. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in the peace of the Lord Jesus. 
and may that peace extend not only to you, but everyone affected by you. That the enemy would have no place in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll go in peace and have a wonderful week. And there's plenty of snacks, coffee, yada yada. If anybody's interested in taking information on our phone number or whatever, we've got oh, some pulled up. Um, i got a phone number here or even an address. If anyone ever wants to check out an amazing chocolate place, the buffalo is called Chow Chocolate. That's so awesome. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. They, are, they have really top-end chocolates. It's on Elmwood. It's amazing. It's cheap.